We'd like to get the uh, second talk on the way, and uh, please uh, take seats rather than standing, otherwise we'll get into trouble. Um, being one of the, each year, one of the older people uh, in, in, in the AGU, which sort of frightens me a little bit, I suddenly realize that many of you have n not known Charney and, and Bjorknes, and I knew Bjorknes when I was a postdoc at UCLA many, many years ago, and he was a very, very gentle man. And I knew Charney, who was my advisor for a few years at MIT, and he was not a gentleman. He was a gentleman, but a, a, a man full of energy. That you could not have a bigger difference between Bjorknes and and Charney in the personalities. But they were both visionaries. And Bjorknes, of course, one might say he's the father of climate because he's the person who joined theoretically uh, the ocean and the atmosphere and explained a large degree of our interannual variability. Uh, Charney, of course, you might think of him as the theoretical father of numerical weather prediction. And uh, as he developed the basic um, tools, theoretical tools for understanding uh, certain instabilities. But they're both visionaries and both, in a way, set forth where we are today. And we tried very hard uh, in our section to attract uh, visionaries, people who uh, are in, in, in a sense, the, the, the Chinese and the Bjorkness of, of our present day. And, and we just heard Paul give a lovely talk. Uh, Graham Stevens is a person I've known for longer than Graham and I would probably like to remember. It's about 30, 35 years. We shared our first office together. And I was always impressed with what a bright guy he was, but what a good fun guy he was to be with. We've been friends ever since. But uh, he was at CSIRO. We were there together in Australia where he was working on very basic fundamental clouds and radiation. And he's kept that theme going. But he went to CSU where he was on the faculty for 20 odd years and now is the chief scientist for climate at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Um, he is a visionary. Uh, he, he sees things that other people don't see until he tells them about it. And he is a person who has, um, uh, beside many publications, uh, a person who has told us so much about clouds by the creation of CloudSat, uh, which is part of the A-train a, a, a uh, whizzing round now. And uh, so Graham today is going to talk about uh, something which I'm sure is akin to that, and it's the climate change, a very cloudy picture. So would you help me welcome Graham? Um, well, thank you, Peter. This is a great honour. Um, it's a great honour to be able to reflect a little bit on a topic that I've kind of been working on ever since my graduate days, almost 40 years ago, on and off in the background. Um, and hence, I've seen quite a significant change occur in this general area of the science over these 40 years. And um, I entered the field at a time when cloud and radiation well, it wasn't considered to be so, so that's so important, uh, primarily because I guess uh, the climate and, and the climate modeling sort of grew out of NWP way, way back. And the NWP perspective was that clouds and radiation and that kind of physics wasn't so important to NWP, although, as Chani had said, it wasn't, he did believe it wasn't important to NWP, although he did recognize, of course, physics became increasingly important for climate. So my day when I started, um, the models, many of the models, most of the models actually just had only average clouds. That is, that's clouds that didn't vary in longitude and only varied in latitude. And you only had to fix the radiative properties because after all, all you had to do was kind of tweak them to get the radiation balance right and that was it. Um, so there were no, so what we call feedbacks in the models at that, that, that time. So I had a hell of a time trying to convince this, that community that cloud radiation interaction was probably important. Um, and I would get comments like, and I, and I demonstrated at that time in the early 70s the importance of properties like cloud optical depth. And I was told, there's no way in my lifetime will I ever see cloud optical depth in a climate model. And um, I said, well, maybe in your lifetime, but um, um, I was a young upside then. And um, I, did, I sort of pointed out that the cloud optical depth was intimately related to the, the water properties of clouds, and certainly we're going to have to see that in our lifetime, the pre 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 prognostic equations for water, which we have seen. Yes, they said, but okay, but there's no way in hell we'll ever see microphysics in a climate model. 
That was that, that was the t not at least not in my lifetime, according to the sages of that time in the 70s. And of course, we know things have changed. So things have changed dramatically um, since then. So it's in that with that background, I'm going to kind of give you a, a walk through the cloud climate problem um, and, and try to emphasise some of the real advances that I think have taken place. I'd like to just acknowledge a few of the various folks who have contributed to this particular talk. And I guess the forward is one of these buttons. That's one thing I didn't check is how to go forward. Um, and I'd like to do this in the background or the backdrop of the, um, the A train that, that Peter mentioned um, for reasons that will come apparent as we go along. Um, and what I'd like to do is... Um, where is the mouse? Oh, got it. That's great. That's great. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about cloud radiation fever, jump right to the present and kind of present you what the latest, the latest sort of viewpoint from CMIP5 and what's the impending AR5 um, um, assessment is likely to show. Um, why there is apparent lack of progress, and I think this is probably not an accurate way to put it because there's quite a deal of progress and I'm going to emphasise that. What makes this particular climate feedback complicated and hence why there's apparent lack of progress? Um, um, what, what's the recipe for progress? I'm going to touch on these topics. Um, are there other forms of cloud radiation feedback of relevance? And um, sort of summarise and challenge and provide kind of a, a sort of a, a small vision for the path forward to continue to make progress in this. Um, okay, so this is a sort of take home message. Um, Within the current paradigm that quantifies the feedback in terms of global mean surface temperature, and this is the paradigm we operate in today, um, cloud feedbacks will always remain highly uncertain. That's not, that's not going to change, and that's not going to change in the future. Um, that's not going to change with more advanced models and higher, higher spatial resolution. It's just not going to change. And the reason it's not going to change is because fundamentally the cloud changes that feedback on the energy balance of the planet they're multifaceted, they vary in space, they adjust in time, and they're not simply determined by global mean surface temperature. So trying to force fit those changes in fun as function of global mean surface temperature just doesn't work, and hence that's the reason why the models have this widespread in cloud feedback. Um, and that, as I said, that's not going to change and, and, unless we consider a different way of articulating the climate change and the feedback problem. And I don't have an answer for that. I'm just saying that uh, you, you go, we're going to be down this road in 10 years' time. In 20 years' time, we'll still see the spread in the climate sensitivities that we see today through the cloud feedback. OK, so despite the large and varied effects of clouds on the climate sensitivity, significant progress is occurring. And I'm going to hint at areas where significant progress. We're actually on the cusp of seeing real major progress occurring in the way water flows through the atmosphere and the way we model it and the way we understand it. Uh, the fundamental, fundamentally, the recipe for progress lies at really at the process level, improving our understanding at the process level on the global scale. I emphasise on the global scale, um, and better representing the way these processes are treated in models or expressed in models. So that's the take-home message. That's it. So if I don't get any further than that, that's the take-home message. But now I'm going to kind of build up the story a little bit as we go. Um, Cloud radiation, climate feedback, simplistic notions of uh, sort of showing this little cartoony type um, uh, flow diagram, I mean, um, so, a feedback cycle diagram. Imagine a climate that's forced, that's changed in some way, and we think of this as global mean temperature, or that's an, that's an issue, as I just said. In some way, it drives a change in clouds, and clouds in turn change the radiation and change back the climate. That's the sort of the simplistic, you know, uh, feedback 101 kind of uh, figure. Um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, the 70s and 80s sort of fo focused on advancing the radio transfer tools, quantifying the effects of clouds and radiation. So much of the 70s and some of the 80s was just about part of that loop that goes from clouds to radiation with some notional effect on climate. And it wasn't until sort of the 90s and the present that it was uh, where the focus shifted towards how radiation and the climate environment shapes clouds, and that's in sort of closing that loop in, more, in a more scientifically rigorous way. And in fact, this, is a, this was one of the motivating forces um, for not just the cloud set, but a vision we had back in the early 90s for what became the A-Train, although we didn't have a vision that the A-Train would appear the way it did. Um, but my, my, many of the component parts of the A-Train, we had a vision for a mission to do, to address this kind of critical science. For, for it was very clear to me in the late 80s that 
with either topic that you're interested in, either aspect of this feedback loop we're interested in, the need for far more advanced types of observational data, particularly on the global scale, that gave us better clues for how the process is operated, it was, was, was absolutely clear that we needed that. And we were not not going to address this problem with the kinds of cloud observations that we were gathering with satellite data at that time. And to fall back, just as a kind of a, a message, to fall back to that kind of observ observing strategy um, is, is a major step backwards. So um, I'm going to kind of emphasise that point as I go along. So we just wouldn't, weren't going to get there. We weren't going to be able to address the processes at the level we need to understand in order to really advance cloud feedback problems. So hence the birth of these new satellite observations that we now see in the Adrian. Um, so let me just as a little background sort of build a story as, I, as we delve into the CMIP5 results um, and what it's showing now in terms of the current kinds of analysis. Um, we first start with um, a planet like, uh, which we call the all-sky planet, where we have clouds, the clear atmosphere, the aerosol, everything there that's reflecting sunlight and emitting radiation to space. And this is kind of a sort of a primer for discussion of the feedback analysis. And then we imagine that, that stripped away of all of its clouds, we had the clear sky. And so we define what we call a cloud radiate effect. It's kind of the currency to analyse, uh, or a currency used to study cloud feedback. We define this cloud radiation effect as the difference between the clear sky radiation coming out to space and the all sky. And so what that means is in the long wave, we basically have a long wave effect that's by this definition is greater than zero. And that's kind of the greenhouse effect. That's the, the, tra the you can think of this as the trapping of infrared radiation, um, trapping of infrared radiation by clouds themselves. And then on the other side of the equation, you've got the albedo effect where cl clouds reflect more sunlight to space um, so, so the net energy going into the planet is reduced and they, they, so the cloud sh short wave effect, as we call it, is, is negative. Um, it was actually in the 70s, quite interesting. In the 70s, uh, there were a number of studies presented in the 70s and the, the burning question in the 70s was, is the net, the sum of the greenhouse and albedo effect, is it positive, negative or neutral? This was a burning question that um, uh, a number of papers were written, as I said, uh, and it really wasn't answered until Irby in the 1980s. The reason the satellite observations couldn't really address it in the 70s is that we had a hell of a time trying to get the clear sky view uh, devoid of clouds because the sensors at those times were very wide, swat, wide fields of view and um, um, many, many degrees of latitude, longitude and sort of fo footprint size. So it was, the 80, it was in the 80s with the broadband scanning instrument of Irby that became clear what the net effect of clouds was on the top of the atmosphere radiation balance and it was overall planet wise it was negative. So clouds reflect more, the albedo effect was a little more dominant than the greenhouse effect. So that was a major step forward in the 80s measurements. Okay, so this leads me now with that, with that background to a little bit of discussion about the um, uh, CMIP. And, um, and one of the things that's evolved over the last maybe decade is uh, the different tools or techniques or diagnostic tools, I suppose we call them, to analyse feedback. And this is the one, and what I'm going to show you is the analysis tools uh, using the methods of Gregory et al. And it's sort of a fairly simple idea and it's very attractive and it's very attractive to think of global feedbacks this way, but of course it doesn't work for clouds as I've already said, but nevertheless this persist. Um, the net top of the atmospheric flux is just the absorbed solar minus the emitted long wave. That's the way we can define it in, in a simple sense. And let's postulate that a change in the net flux associated with a, f climate, a climate force system has, is, relate, is a function of the forcing itself, that's F, and the response in the fluxes, which we'll postulate just varies linearly as a function of the global change in global mean temperature. This is the postulate of Gregory et al. And so if, you, if we think of it this way, and think of a, a simulation of change in net flux as a function of, this is sort of time, this is global mean surface temperature change, but it's also the evolution of the model over time. And this is what work from Tim Andrews, a paper has just been submitted. Um, and it shows you just one experiment of double CO2 experiment under CMIP3, but I'm going to show you the CMIP5 results of Tim's analysis in a moment. And this shows you the change of the model response as a function of time. This is all global mean, global mean change in radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere and so on. So the way you interpret this, coming back to this simple equation that Gregory proposed, was at the intercept here, where the delta T is zero, is the net change of radiation at the top of the atmosphere is just the forcing. You can see it there in this model, it's about 400 bit watts per meter squared for this doubling. 
Um, the slope gives you the total feedback of the system, and the intercept uh, when n is zero gives you the climate sensitivity at the doubling CO2. So this is, this is actually a convenient tool because it allows you to estimate the climate sensitivity without ever reaching the equilibrium. You just extrapolate this linear curve down to this, to this point. Um, so imagine different models with different sensitivities, with different uh, feedbacks, um, each giving you a different climate sensitivity. So when you, when you do this for a collection of climate models, as Tim has done for the CMIP-5 four times CO2 experiments, this is what you get. You basically get the uh, measure of the feedback, and he, put, he puts it as one on the feedback parameter on, on, on the y-axis, and the climate sensitivity on the x-axis. And this is the spread of the models who had contributed at that time to these four times CO2 experiments. And this was a paper just submitted about, oh, about two or three weeks ago. Um, so there's a spread in the, in the response to the models. Uh, there's a spread, obviously, in the response to the models, and it's related directly to the range of the feedbacks in the models. That's what this simple postulate of Gregory's is built upon. So what's the feedbacks? And as you can guess, it's the clouds that re represent this spread. Um, and, so what, and since the, net, net, the change of energy balance at the top of the atmosphere is the it can be broken into component parts, a clear sky, the cloud radiative effect, long wave and short wave. You can start to do this kind of analysis and peel apart the contribution by the clear sky long wave, the clear sky short wave, and the cloud short wave, and the cloud long wave. And that's exactly what Tim has done. And what you find that when you take the clear sky is the models, there's a general consensus among the CMIP-5 models that the long wave clear sky, the feedback that you infer from the long wave clear sky, are strongly negative, minus 1.7 watts per meter square per degree Kelvin. Um, it's dominated by the Planck, what they call the Planck feedback, offset by a positive water vapor feedback slightly. So it's negative. So warming means more, uh, it means a, re um, it means a uh, more emission to space because more emission to space following Planck's law is just, it follows just simply Planck's law. The water vapor feedback opposes that but not, not wipes it out. And the short wave clear sky feedback is positive, 0.7 watts per meter squared, mostly, and the models both mostly agree with this, and it's basically split between a water vapor feedback, which tends not to be discussed that much in the community, and the surface snow ice change of feedback. Now, when you go to clouds, this is the story, and this is the story of the nine models that Tim had analyzed, and basically you find that there's a spread of positive negative feedbacks, and there's some neutral kind of feedbacks occurring in these models as well. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, what you see is the models not only lack consensus, but the cloud feedback is also not linear with delta T. Um, and so what he's done, he, he's come up with numbers, what he calls a long-term feedback, he just does a slope analysis, um, at warming greater than about two degrees to kind of fit the, 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 the changes, the long-term changes. There's fast changes occurring in the model that aren't, don't go as delta T at all. So the end result is if you look at the total model feedback in CMIP-5 and the cloud feedback in CMIP-5, the conclusion is, as it was in CMIP-3 and AR4 and so on, is that differences in cloud feedback are, again, the largest single source of uncertainty of all feedbacks. Basically, the spread, for those astute of you, the spread in the total feedback of the models, the magnitude of that spread is the same as the magnitude of the spread of the cloud feedback. So models continually have the spread in the feedback, the spread in the client response is driven by this cloud f feedback spread. And as I said, I don't believe this is going to change because this, to a somewhat large extent, is a function of the analysis itself. And the way forward is not this way. The way forward is to dig into the key processes and try to understand it at the building block level, process level. Okay. So why is apparent, why the apparent lack of progress? As I said, reducing climate sensitivity range, which really is the unspoken goal of a lot of climate research, is to reduce that climate sensitivity range so we all know what the global warming is going to be, um, is a wrong measure of progress in this, for this topic. It's a wrong measure of progress. Why is it so, what's so complicated about the feedbacks anyway, the cloud feedbacks anyway? I'm going to kind of dwell a little bit on this. And the reason is fundamentally why this is the case is there isn't one feedback that operates at any one time. There are multiple, there's a collection of cloud feedbacks that are different in character, have different strengths, different si uh, 
signs, they vary in different regions, and when you aggregate them together, get the global picture, you get a very confused picture of global mean sensitivity with, uh, as it relates to cloud feedback. So what's the recipe for progress? As I said, I emphasize that there's no sort of, I don't have a crystal ball or a magic wand, I just see how we have to dig in and do the hard work and really build up an understanding at the, at the building block level itself, at the process level itself. We have to do it on a global scale though. You know, I spent 15 years of my early part of my career in aircraft measurements and you don't, you're not gonna address the global climate for cloud feedback problems with collections of aircraft measurements. You're just not gonna get there. And uh, uh, in my view, back point. And, and then the other question I, I can, can, won't have time really to touch on, but is the delta T centric view of feedback the only form of cloud radiation feedback of relevance? And this t tends not to be discussed much, but actually the answer is no. And there are key radiation feedbacks that we think exist on precipitation that don't get discussed much. And uh, I'll talk, maybe touch briefly on it right at the end. Okay, so let me, talk, let me talk about a little bit what cloud feedback and the multifaceted aspects of it, which in principle is the, uh, the various factors that make the problem on the surface complicated, but I think when you dig deeper down, there's a sort of some guiding principles I think we can think about to move forward in this problem. And I'd like to do this in the contrast of the water vapor feedback, and I do this within the context of this this comment made by Chamberlain to Abbott, and Abbott did a lot of early work in the early 1900s on the energy balance of, of Earth, and it was about water vapour feedback, and, and, and Chamberlain noted that water vapour, confessedly the greatest thermal absorbent in the atmosphere, is dependent upon temperature for its amount, and if another agent, as CO2, not so dependent, raises the temperature of the surface, it calls into function a certain amount of water vapour which further absorbs heat, raises the temperature, and so on. This is a very lucid description of the water vapor feedback way, way back more than 100 years ago. So, you know, water vapor feedback was kind of somewhat, I would say, understood 100 years ago. It's just I think that in the last series of IPCC, we got a little bit muddled up about the water vapor feedback. We ought to go back to think, dwell on this comment a little bit more. But um, maybe let's think about it in the context of clouds. It's reasonably clear what although there will be debate by some folks in your audience here about water vapour itself, um, but it's reasonably clear what we think we mean by water vapour. It's much less clear what we mean by clouds. And that's part of the complication here. Um, and so let me, let me sort of call, go back to a, a paper by Steve Schneider published in 1972, and I'm going to pull out his concluding comments here that expand up here. And he notes that the variation in cloudiness refers to a change in the amount of cloud cover, the change in the effective cloud top height and the change in cloud albedo. So you've got these three parameters at least a part of the equation in terms of cloud, potential cloud feedback. And before this paper by Schneider, Suki Manabe and Strickler wrote this paper in 64 where they introduced this idea of critical blackness of clouds and this is shown here, this is, the, this is pressure and this is cloud emissivity and this curve here represents the demarcation in his, their equilibrium climate simula simulations um, above which the clouds heat the climate system, below which clouds cool the climate system. So it's kind of a threshold of emissivity. Uh, now these calculations were flawed because he just set the solar part of the equation fixed and just changed the albedo, I mean the emissivity. But it is, does call in the point that there's yet a fourth parameter called the emissivity of the cloud. So the albedo, emissivity, cloud top height, cloud amount. In my work in the late 70s, um, I basically introduced the kind of the connecting, thing, the, the factors that connect particularly the um, emissivity and albedo to the cloud water and the optical depth. And so really the key parameters in the feedback and all feedback analysis are cloud amount, cloud height, cloud, height, cloud water path, and that's, they're the key parameters that, that, that today we discuss cloud feedbacks around. Mostly the feedbacks are discussed around cloud amount. The majority of the discussion of climate feedbacks, cloud climate feedback is about cloud amount. Um, in this paper that Peter and I wrote, I pulled this up because I knew Peter was uh, chairing this. I mean, um, paper we wrote in 1981, uh, we, we demonstrated how the, how the two, two effects, the greenhouse effect of the clouds and the albedo effect of the clouds varies according to how optically thick the cloud is or how much water exists in the clouds. So high thin clouds, H high thin clouds, warm, uh, low thick clouds, cool. And this was a basis for both the liquid water path dependence of the radiated properties and, and this high cloud warming was a basis for other subsequent feedback 
concepts, including the iris hypothesis of Dick Lindzen, the optical depth feedbacks that, that were popular in the 80s and so on, um, by Pol Poltridge and Charlock and others. Okay, um, the thermal absorbent character of water is greatly enhanced when in condensed phase on a molecule by molecule basis. You do a calculation just on the emissivity of clouds versus the, the gaseous atmosphere. Um, it's about, uh, the amount of water when it's in condensed form is about a thousand times more strongly than in vapor, in vapor phase. So what that basically means, a small change in vapor condensed to water makes a hell of a difference in terms of radiative properties. This is part of the complication. If you say, think about it in terms of an energy, the water balance of the planet, and you go from the total water of the planet, the fresh component, and break the fresh component down ultimately to get the atmosphere, which is a tiny part of the fresh part, and the clouds are a tiny part, the cloud condensed water that hovers in the atmosphere is a tiny part of the total water vapor, the total water in the atmosphere. And so small changes in water vapor can lead to significant changes in cloud water, and that has a, that has a disproportionate influence on the radiation balance of the atmosphere. So this is a real challenge for modelling clouds and modelling the, the distribution of water in the atmosphere. And it's been a real challenge up until recently where we've begun to make real progress in terms of observing this and being able to now constrain models to where we think nature is in terms of the amount of water in the atmosphere. Now I show this as this is work from Frank, uh, Frank Lee from JPL here where he's taken the ice observations now from CloudSat and the blue are the observations basically and there are four different sets of observations. Different groups don't necessarily believe the formal CloudSat retrieval of ice so they do their own and they see the observations all hover down here and this is a Taylor diagram, standard deviation and correlation so good is high correlation and low standard deviation. So these are the observations. Um, and yeah, there are different flavours of that. I won't go into the details of that. Um, the uh, the CMIP3, this is a diagram that demonstrates there's been quite significant progress with this observational information. Armed with this observational information, we've made really significant progress in uh, the model uh, models. This is CMIP3. This is the multi-model mean of CMIP3. This is the multi-model mean of CMIP5. And so you can see we've made some, just in terms of this metric, we've made quite significant progress in characterising the clouds. It's been driven a lot by these new observations that we've had. And the liquid water path is a lot more, um, the story of liquid water path, unfortunately, is not quite as good. This is the liquid water path uh, uh, of clouds. These are the models down here and these are the observations. I've crossed out one set of observations. The observations are here. Um, and the models on the whole, the models have a factor of two or more liquid water in them than uh, we, we think we observe from nature. This is quite significant. The reason it's quite significant is when you think about how sunlight's reflected by clouds, um, an optical depth of 10, the sensitivity of sunlight reflected from by change in cloud optical depth um, is, about, um, is about four times the sensitivity at your optical depth 20. So by a factor of two, difference in liquid water path has a huge influence in terms of how much the albedo sensitivity um, might change as you, uh, with low, low clouds. And hence, um, it's not su perhaps surprising that the global models with these large amounts of liquid water have very low op optical depth feedback in them. Let's go over that. Um, okay, the other thing is the, uh, there's um, offsetting effects that we have to kind of contemplate um, that both nature is rather a curious uh, thing. Um, um, Sean Toomey said that she, uh, Mother Nature is rather a clever little devil, she said, in, and he said in his Irish accent, um, because strangely when you get a change in clouds um, where you get ch change in some of the long wave emission properties of clouds, you get actually offsetting short wave changes and the net effect sometimes is not, not observed or you're hard to see. And why is that so? Well, Toomey says it's because nature's rather clever to be able to do that. Um, so one way to think about this is if you look at the cloud radiative effect, the short and long wave, and the net is the sum of the two, and let's suppose there's some change. This is just a simple idea to kind of illustrate the fact that there's a, there's a large amount of cancellation going on in terms of cloud changes on the radiation balance itself. Um, so if you imagine some cloud parameter changes, that changes the, uh, these, these cloud radiative effects, then you can kind of come up with some index which is conveniently greater than zero when greenhouse effect dominates, at zero when 
short and long wave cancel. Short wave's negative, remember, long wave positive. And uh, it's negative when the albedo effect dominates. So that's kind of a nice little convenient tool. And it's just sort of to illustrate the complexity of this cancellation that takes place. So if you take the series data, oh, no, no right before I do that, if you, t if you consider the diagram of the net radio effect and long wave effect in the diagram of this form, and measure, ma imagine one climate state and you perturb it to another climate state, then when the greenhouse effect dominates, you'd imagine a moving along this sort of uh, locus there. Uh, neutral will be along there and um, albedo dominate would be along there. So when you go to the tropics, what, this is what you see in terms of this sort of diagram. So if you interpret this change in the distribution of points in the tropics, which is not strictly so, but it just makes the point, as a change in, from one climate state to another, then the tropics mostly is neutral. So long wave feedbacks and short wave feedbacks in this sort of scenario will kind of offset and cancel. When you go to the middle latitudes, it's kind of a very mixed bag. You've got short wave effects, you've got long wave effects, and things are sort of mixed up. This just speaks to the fact that you've got some sort of off got offsetting effects that make the interpretation of the feedbacks um, kind of con somewhat convoluted. Um, this actually is an important point that's really often overlooked in feedback studies. Most feedbacks are actually, most of the co feedback concepts are, are, are hypothesised affecting only one component, like shortwave mostly, low cloud feedbacks, thermostat, for example, feedback of Raman, Arthur and Collins and so on, or the long wave feedback, the fat related feedbacks that uh, Dennis Hartman and group have been proposing, the iris feedback and so are all long wave based, uh, without compensating effects in the other. But it's clearly, clearly nature seems to be introducing these compensating effects and the question is, is this really, are these assumptions really overall correct? Um, and so Eagle Poster, for example, talks about this in relation to the fat, hypoth the fat hypothesis um, listed there. Okay, um, now the other important point that I want to kind of underscore is, um, I'm going to get back to, and I want to show you some, uh, some real evidence for where we're improving things. Um, clouds also couple and influence many of the other climate feedbacks, which makes them such a pain in the neck um, from a point of view of a climate, uh, from climate diagnostics. They both mask the radiative process that determine other feedbacks. They sit above surface, for example, and they mask surface feedbacks, for example. And then they even enhance the, those other feedbacks themselves. And I'm going to show you an example of this from real data in a moment. Um, any surface-related feedback that re needs sunlight and needs water is going to be strongly influenced by cloud feedbacks. So carbon-related feedbacks are going to be strongly influenced by cloud feedbacks. So let me consider this, uh, this, uh, the surface albedo and the sea ice uh, example. This is a 2007 sea ice loss, and I'll show you some results from the A train. What we found from the A train is that over the two, period of 2007, uh, the summer of 2007, the atmosphere was incredibly warm, incredibly dry, or basically no clouds for the entire summer season, and lots and lots of sunshine. Uh, the influence on the radiation balance uh, shown in the Western Arctic, the influence on the radiation balance is that you have 32 watts per metre squared on a monthly mean basis, more sunlight into the Arctic Ocean, which was enough to melt a third of a metre of ice or heat the um, this mixed ocean mixed layer by 2.4 degrees, according to the calculations of Gen K in 2007. So this is just an example of how these these processes and the cloud processes and feedbacks that might occur in climate change can feed in and amplify or negate the other feedbacks in the other system. Okay, so let me get down to some processes and, um, yeah, some processes and where we're beginning to make advances and what things we're beginning to discover about the, about the world. Um, one of the things we've discovered about the world from the A train is that, and it's sort of shown here, this is the albedo as a function of this is the cloud albedo here, and this is just a PDF. And basically what we've learned is that raining clouds are a hell of a lot brighter than non-raining clouds. It's pretty obvious to um, probably the man on the street, but it's not, it wasn't obvious to the scientists. Um, and there's all sorts of evidence now building that um, precipitation is, has an important radiative signature that we haven't really considered, I don't think, in feedbacks, except that one of my old colleagues and a mentor of mine way, 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 way back, Garth Poultridge, speculated on rainfall albedo feedback, slightly of a different nature than I'm suggesting here, uh, but speculated on these rainfall albedo feedbacks. I think that this is a, an area where there's key, there's the processes of 
radiation and precipitation, I think, are very pertinent to some of our some of our issues of climate and climate change, and it's an it's a it's an area to expand, an area to um, area to explore. Um, rain forming processes. We are literally, I was going to say, we're literally on the cusp of making quite substantial improvements in global models in the way they represent precipitation. Uh, we're on the cusp of these improvements. We're not there. It's not in our CMIP five. We're not there yet, but we're we're on the way. Um, in this paper of mine that uh, published in 2010, we showed that fundamentally, and it was I sort of knew this, but this is the first time we could definitively state this over at the global oceans, is that the climate models and the weather prediction models basically produce precipitation about twice as often as we observe, and the intensity of precipitation was about half the intensity we observe. Because the product of frequency and intensity is the total accumulation, and that's about observed because the radiation balance dictates that it has to be, you know, the three millimetres a day, you know what I mean? Um, so these, this was a fairly, this is, I believe was a fairly major problem with the models and has fairly major implications for f how we understand even feedbacks and radiation feedbacks. Um, we're on the cusp of making substantial progress in improving precipitation forming processes in models. The breakthrough, I think, that uh, there's never really a breakthrough in our science, but the breakthrough, if there isn't one, is was our ability, essentially, to jointly observe cloud and precipitation in the A-train. Um, we have now an observing system that allows us to see um, uh, fairly unambiguously cloud separate from precip. Okay, so this is um, just sort of illustrates that same point about the bias in models. And this is taken from the latest version of the ECMWF forecast model versus the surface global data of precipitation. This is over land, obviously. <coughs> and for light rain of uh, 0.25 millimetres um, over a 24-hour period. Um, the model is biased. This is, this is the ratio of model to OBS is one. So the model has about 50% more of this light rain than the, observa than the observations. When you go to heavy rain, things look somewhat, the model's tuned somewhat more towards the observations. So the model clearly, this is just a one way to show that the model has way too much light rain. We see this in a looking at the CloudSat data, um, we were able to show, well, you can cloud that data, this is the um, incidence of precipitation and this is the different models, ECMWF, UK Met Office, CAM, NCA, client model, two global cloud resolving models. The bottom line is that this bias in the precipitation carries all the way through to these global cloud resolving models and resolution alone doesn't solve this issue, it's physics, the representation of physics in the model. I won't talk about the second panel, but that's just another example of evidence of the model wants to make ev everything, all the water down low has to has a drizzle in it or rain in it. Okay, so this this illustrated what we believe are systematic uh, systemic problems in the way precipitation is driving all global models. The um, biases, ten minutes, the biases um, have a number of important implications for modelling of the earth of the coupled earth system. You can imagine. The way water flows in through the system, runoff, soil moisture, build up, wet deposition of aerosol, or latent heating, storm dynamics, all those things. This has implications for all those things, I believe. Um, so one of the ways we began able to di begin to dissect it, this is one, and this is in Suzuki's talk in 2000, uh, this, at this meeting, uh, I think it's tomorrow afternoon. Um, we've been able to basically show precipitation and cloud information matched together. And this is, this is a fraction of occurrence of precipitation. This is the cloud water path. These are observations. This is, the red means no rain. So as the liquid water path increases, the probability of no rain dramatically decreases and the probability of rain rapidly increases. Um, the green is drizzle. I won't go boy the details, how, how we define drizzle, but it's, the green is drizzle and the blue is rain. Now, when you go to, the, I'm going to show you results from two different flavours of cloud resolving models. These would be the models that maybe in 10 years, perhaps, with the global climate models will reach that point. This is the global cloud resolver model, and it's a one, what's called a one moment scheme. So it only has one moment that it predicts water on. Um, it has basically, it turns rain on stra almost straight away. It has rain pretty much immediately as you go as one the water path. So the rain gets turned on almost immediately. As soon as you get water, it goes to rain. No drizzle. 
The second scheme uh, model is the RAMS model, which is a two-moment scheme. This actually allows you to have a, allows you to predict sort of on the drizzle itself. So it has drizzle, carries drizzle along with it. You start to see things a little bit more like observations, but it too is a little bit excited about when it rains, and it rains a little bit too much. Um, but this is a sort of progress that we're beginning to make, and we're beginning to, be able to delve in and look at the parameterization schemes. And at ECMW, they've gone further and basically looked at their parameterization schemes, the different processes that make rain, in the warm rain in this case, and they've tweaked things in order to match to what we see the light rain in the observations or, or suggests. And that has been done at ECMWF. It's not yet operational, but it has significant knock-on effects on the model. And this is shown here. This is shown here with column water vapor and precipitation. Convective precipitations change by the order of about um, 5 to 10 percent, and the column water vapors change by the order of 5 to 10 percent. When they just tune the light rain, this is not convective rain, they haven't touched the convective rain parameterization, they just tuned the light rain to make it drizzle less, and what they've done in this case is made the rain evaporate more, the light rain evaporate more. They've done a simple thing. When rain is light, light rain evaporates more than heavy rain. Now, the previous versions of that model, the UK Met Office model, that rain at all rain rates evaporated at the same rate which is clearly non-physical. <clears throat> so we're beginning to make, as I said, progress in this area. Um, the second area that we're just beginning to touch on and see progress on is in convective, the convective processes. And convection, as you know, occurs on all scales. This is kind of, in some ways, the Achilles heel of climate modelling because so many of the climate and earth system processes couple to convection itself. Convection is one of the main ways is the atmosphere mixes heat, and moisture, and constituents. We're beginning to see progress, and I don't have a nice fancy graphic of this other than I show one result from Johnny Liu's talk from yesterday. Um, McGee et al. have a talk tomorrow, or this afternoon actually, or I'm further to show this, but we're beginning to actually be quantify information like the um, buoyancy of convection and bulk entrainment. We've been able to count how many hot towers exist around the planet freely for the first time. Um, so we're beginning to make inroads in terms of convection. And an example of this is shown in this again with the ECMWF where they've taken these observations to heart and really, really working their physics parameterizations to, um, to learn from what we're observing from the observations. And this panel's down on the right hand side show the ice contents of clouds. The previous scheme, the new scheme, and the cloud set version of the ice. And there's a, I'm sure there's a variety of talks coming up in this meeting about the ice content by Dwayne Wallace and Frank Lee and, and others in the uh, others around the community have been looking at this a quite deal, some deal. What they've basically done is change the way snow is developed in the models, the snow component of the parameterization, and change the way ice falls through the atmosphere. And when they change that way the ice falls in the atmosphere, the, the ice allow the ice to hover longer, increases the ice content, increases the cloud fraction, and that has significant influences on this forecast model. It goes from a model where you have this only averaged uh, this height, latitude, this is only average um, errors in, in temperature, the colours is only average errors in temperature, you've got a cold bias through most of the tropics, for example. This is a classic long-term bias in the model. Two, when you introduce more high clouds, you remove you know, a large chunk of the uh, cold bias and just reduce the cold bias overall. And that has also then through the effects on atmospheric stability on convection, it has effects of changing the convective precipitation in ways that they claim are significant. That to me, to my eye, doesn't look that significant to me, but I would like to see wholesale changes. But um, to a forecast model, uh, which is highly tuned um, and highly evaluated, that's quite significant. This is quite interesting because uh, I mentioned something about cloud radiation feedbacks that weren't global mean temperature centric. This is a feedback that in the paper that um, Todd Ollis and I wrote in uh, 2008, we noted that the feedback to global temper of global precipitation in the CMIP3 models, there was a definitely high cloud stability radiation feedback on the global precipitation in these models. Yeah. So this is an example of digging in and trying to understand the convective processes and the cloud, high clouds detrained from convection, and we're beginning to make progress. Okay, so just to summarize, because Peter given me the, the nod. Um, Cloud feedbacks involve compensating albedo and greenhouse effects of varying degrees. 
um, different types of feedbacks related to cloud amount changes, cloud height changes, water content changes, particle size changes, and so on occur. Couple, uh, um, cloud feedbacks also couple other aspects of the climate system affecting other feedbacks such as water vapor feedback, surface LBs, and so on. These make the relationship between the aggregated effects of the change, uh, the aggregated effects of clouds to the change in global mean temperature poorly posed. Since the relationship doesn't really, since this relationship doesn't really exist, um, reducing the spread of such a relationship ought not to be viewed as the measure of progress. Furthermore, cloud and water vapor radiation feedbacks also control global changes in precipitation amount, character, suggesting that other types of feedback, other types of feedback need to be contemplated. Um, Instead, uh, progress should be measured by improvements in understanding of processes jointly in both in the real Earth system and in models of it. Real progress is occurring, but much is still remains to be done. We have a real head scratch in terms of mixed phase clouds, both to observe it on a large scale and, into and also model it and represent it. And this is an example. Again, I pulled it from uh, ECMWF because it actually is quite a telling example, and the global implication of this goes beyond just this example. Uh, this shows you. The mixed phase, the, the, the two metre temperature uh, forecast using an old scheme where they just, they just said mixed phase shall be simply some proportion of temperature from somewhere between zero and minus 20. Uh, it defines a fraction of mixed phase in that at volume of atmosphere. Uh, the, with their clever new physics, they've got now prognostic ice and water and some attempt to prognose the mixed phaseness of the clouds and all hell broke loose. They got this incredibly cold uh, forecast over Scandinavia, and this caused all sorts of political issues for the ECMWF, the, such as the member states were threatening to pull money and funding. It's a major issue. Um, it turns out that using A-train observations, they were able to diagnose the fact that they're not representing the amount of mixed phase clouds at that point, and they actually cleared out the clouds, you know, the, that part of the atmosphere being in the kind of the winter time, radiably cooled, and this part of the world was cooling too much and the surface temperature was way too cold by tens of degrees. I mean, we're not talking one or two degrees, we're talking tens of degrees. So they quickly got to the satellite OBS, did a bit of tweaking of their parameterization. This is the analysis, by the way, of what the temperature was, and they quickly uh, tweaked it and uh, tried to fix it hurriedly with red faces and then apologised to the Scandinavians and off they went. But it's, it underscores the issue is just the point of mixed phase clouds remain a challenge for us. Okay, another real challenge for us um, is that, I want to beat this point uh, on the head a little bit, we need the right observing system to make progress on this topic. Uh, in my view, the suite of active probes we now enjoy have to be the backbone of any meaningful global observatory. Um, you wouldn't believe how much difference it makes to know what you're looking at when you try to do the analysis. Um, let me show you Wiskip. Most of you, have, you probably know Wiskip, or many know Wiskip, what Wiskip looks like. Um, we have cloud top pressure. This is the 2D histograms of Wiskip. This is cloud top pressure, cloud optical thickness. So this is bright clouds and this is cold clouds. And bright cold clouds in this corner of deep convection. Um, warm, moderately bright clouds, the stratus form clouds. And this is an example taken from over the West Pacific. Um, so this would be stratiform low clouds, and when you look, when you ask the question, what do the clouds actually look like according to what the radar and lidar observations of the A train are observing, you actually see this result. This is red as cloud base height, black as cloud top height. Ninety percent of the bases are above 440 hectopascals. Ninety percent of the tops are above 440 hectopascals. I want to emphasise again, it makes a hell of a difference to know exactly what you're looking at when you try to extract information and, and to derive cloud properties. Um, so that's what I think where I think our observing systems ought to be in the future. Now I want to close, this is the last view, I want to close with this vision because this was a vision that, that sort of stimulated me over the 20 or so years, or 30 years, it came from Led, Led Lorenz, and I'll just read it. It says, the previous generation was greatly concerned with the dynamics of precious systems and talked about highs and lows. Today we have not lost interest in these, this is in the 70s of course, uh, in these, but we look upon them now as circulation systems. This change in attitude has led to a, a deeper understanding of their dynamics. Perhaps the next generation will be talking about the dynamics of water systems. And I think that's where our next that's where we need to push this vision forward, is to be measuring the dynamics of water systems in, in concert with radiation. 
And so the feedback problem could be, could be encapsulated in a very simple diagram where we have the circulation in the atmosphere, the circulation system shown as a myriad of circulation in the atmosphere. You have processes like deep convection that mix in the vertical. You've got shallow clouds here that also involve mixing in the vertical. And you've got this slantwise horizontal mixing associated with extra tropical storms. And this is, this you can see why when you try to make this, the sum of this, this and this, a function of global mean surface temperature, it doesn't work because this isn't a function of global mean surface temperature, it's a function of atmospheric stability, moisture convergence, and all sorts of other things. And similarly, you go down. So this is the vision I want to leave you with, because I think that's the vision for the next step beyond what I've started in a small way with clouds at the atrium. So thank you. Uh, you could help us very much by, uh, if you raise your hand, we can't see anything because we have spotlights. So if you go to the microphone in the center and line up, then we can ask questions of Graham, who closed the word. I started by saying he was a visionary, and he closed it by saying he was a visionary. So. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. That's just my... Oh, uh, Steve. Steve. Sports. Yes, Steve. Yeah, hi, hi, Graham. Uh, thank you for the, the nice overview. I, I want to um, pick up on your point with respect to uh, uh, feedback driven by global mean surface temperature. Mm -hmm. You made the point several times that you think it's not well posed, that the global mean surface temperature is for, not going... For clouds. Um, for, for clouds. For, for feedback in the climate system. Yeah, for and, clouds. And, and the point that I, I, I really want to make is... I mean, and, and I'll underscore, you're saying for clouds. Yeah. And, and of course, clouds are a major contributor yeah. to the feedback in the climate yeah. system. Yeah. And so the models are having a tough time getting this for the points yeah. that you spoke to. Yeah. But the question I really want to put to you is, do you not think it's useful to speak to the climate system feedback of the real planet as driven by change in global mean surface temperature? Uh, not when it relates to clouds. Because I just showed this diagram here. Look at that. Look, look, Steve. Look at that. I mean, if if, and this sort of encapsulates the, the the prevailing feedbacks that the community talks about: convection-related feedbacks, you know, a low boundary layer cloud-related feedbacks, and mid-latitude storm-related feedbacks. And and fundamentally, the processes that shape the feedbacks aren't a function of global mean temperature; a function of something else. Now, you, you might say that the stability of the tropical atmosphere might be related to the global mean temperature. Yeah, you could make that argument, but when you sum the feedbacks that are occurring all together, it becomes a very muddled mess. I just don't think from a scientific point of view, progress is going to be made that way. Scientifically, I would argue that we need to get in and, f and understand the processes at the process level and build it up from that point. It, I understand fully that we need metrics of, of a progress and metrics of simple metrics that explain the comp the, you know, how the climate system changes. But the clouds, as I explained, are quite complicated in the many te the tentacles or multiple tentacles in which they spread out to influence the climate system. No, I'm, 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 not right? talking, I'm not talking metrics of progress. I'm talking a metric of the climate sensitivity to a forcing. Yes. And, and the, the, the point you made in abundance is the models are having a tough time with that because of the clouds. But the, the question is, does, in your judgment, does, is the planet characterized by a climate sensitivity or not? Um, I don't think one number characterizes it, no, if that's what the question is. I think that you, you probably would find a sensitivity is different in the tropics than it is in somewhere else than it is in, somewhere else, in the polar regions. I don't think one number adequately represents the, the system as a whole. Well, Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. We can debate this, of course, Steve. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a kind of a continuation of the previous question, but... <laughs> I'm the, sure I'll be good. You could make the argument that in 2100, we'd have a good idea about what the, the response of the climate system to a large-scale greenhouse forcing is. Yeah. And transient... Um, and, and therefore, you might expect that transient metrics of cloud properties and climate system properties um, at some point can tell us what, what the response of the system will be. Um, so do you think by 
changing the, the focus of our analysis of, of cloud properties rather than being an instantaneous view of, of the way that the system works at the moment to be a long-term long view of how the cloud properties are changing on an emergent level, mm. even though, as you said, the processes are, are highly coupled and complex and related to other feedbacks in the system, there will still be an emergent response um, in 50 could, years' time. Could be. There could be. I mean, there could be a response that's on a very long time scale that's very different than the short time scale. But what we do know is that the biases that develop in the models on a short period of time persist through the model, through the longer time period, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at, I didn't show this, but Tim Andrews' analysis has shown that you've got this feedback, you've got responses that are different over the first 50 years of the model integration, and you've got a very different response in the model over a longer period of time. Much more simple, simple version of a response in a longer period of time. So it's possible that the system might evolve to something simpler. But, but that's a model. Yeah, sure. So I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what the real world will do. Uh, any more questions? Uh, ah, Michael McIntyre. He's running. He's running. <laughs> it's a bit off the main point, but as a generic comment about the dreadful, the dreadful words climate sensitivity, yeah. uh -huh. um, we're always falling into the trap of thinking with such a thing as the climate sensitivity. And you'd agree, Graham, wouldn't you, that it's important to get away from that, especially if we zoom out to longer timescales, multi-century, millennia. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty clear from the Palio record that yeah. if you're going to talk about climate sensitivity, you, you better consider it to be a lot bigger over those longer timescales because ice sheet dynamics and yeah, yeah, deep yeah. ocean dynamics gets yeah, involved. It's a, I, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I understand the convenience of these metrics, um, but we tend to get locked too much into them. You know, the science tends to get locked too much into them. And, um, Climate sensitivity is supposed to mean this, the change at equilibrium at twice CO2 increase. And, yours, and there are other things going on at different time scales than that, which is true. Yes. What it, it comes down in the end, we never clear to say what thought experiment do we have in mind. If only we'd be more yeah. explicit about all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well. You want me to answer that? or that, That's not really a question. Any, any <laughs> comment you have would be, I'm sure, be of interest. I'm, I tell you, I, you know, this is a complicated problem. I'm just still trying to understand how Mother Nature works in its current state. Yeah, on short you know, time scales, I would say. Yeah, on short time scales. I'm just still living in that world right now because, um, you know, we have a hell of a time trying to figure that out. Um, how do I project that to longer time scales? You know, that's something that, you know, we have to consider. Um, and we do consider, but, you know, as I said, my energy is full of folks on, on here and now because they're big problems that I think we can address. Like that precipitation problem is a big problem. You bet. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to leave it here. I'd like to have one more round of applause for Graham and, and also for Paul. Yeah.